हो गया था हो गया so very good evening to all of you and before we begin with day's proceedings may i request you all to stand up for university anthem today's webinar our honorable vice chancellor has joined us so welcome sir for today's webinar and uh, now may i request professor devinder singh to start with the session honorable vice chancellor professor b s gomar today's speaker professor scott solman from rice university houston usa dr hemendra bharti head of the department of zoology and environmental sciences colleagues research scholars and dear students i extend you all a warm welcome on the 10th and probably the last webinar of the first phase of series of lectures being organized by the department of zoology and environmental sciences earlier we had lectures by distinguished scientists from universities in usa canada and norway as well as from prestigious indian institutes like indian institute of science bangalore indian institute of science education and research pune tata institute of fundamental research mumbai and many others all those lectures are available on the departmental youtube channel and their viewership is increasing day by day i may add here that uh, ours was among the first few departments of the university which started their independent channels we took advantage of these hard times commonly called the covid time to start this series of online lectures and will continue with the same even in the post covid time as online webinars are economical in terms of arrangements time schedule resources as well as financial liabilities professor scott will speak on the topic major transitions in fungus growing and agriculture which will be very interesting for the audience uh, professor gomman 
must have delivered and participated in webinars and seminars related to agriculture. But today, we will hear about agriculture by ants who cultivate their own fungal gardens as food for the colony, just like human beings grow crops in our fields. Ants are highly social insects and are considered at the top of evolutionary tree of insects as we humans consider ourselves to be at the top of mammalian evolution. Once again, a warm welcome to you all. Now I will request Honorable Vice Chancellor G to deliver his opening remarks. Professor Goman, please. Sir, unmute Karloji. Yeah. Uh, esteemed uh, Professor Scott uh, Solomon, speaker of the day from the Department of Biosciences, Rice University, my dear and uh, senior colleague, uh, Dr. Devinder Singh Ji, uh, Dr. Harminder uh, Parthi Ji, head of the Department of Zoology and Environmental Science, dear colleague, Dr. Gavinder Kaur Vadia Ji, and other participants, I extend you all a very warm welcome for uh, joining uh, Punjab University Patiala, the Department of Zoology and Environmental Sciences for this seminar. And I extend a special and warm welcome to our uh, distinguished speaker of the day, Scott Solomon, for agreeing uh, to deliver lecture on a very pertinent uh, theme, agriculture by ants. It would be very useful and interesting to me because uh, I am a social scientist by training, but farmer uh, born in a farm family and have seen the practice of everything. Therefore, it would be very, I think, um, revealing experience for me to listen to you, uh, Mr. Scott, uh, so far agriculture by ants is concerned. Uh, friends, uh, on this occasion, first of all, let me congratulate and compliment uh, the Department of Zoology and Environmental Sciences and head Dr. Haminder Bharti and his team, including senior professor Devinder Singh Ji, for taking a lead in organizing a series of web webinars. We have just started our session and this academic session, you have completed nine webinars and it's 10th in the row. It's a, it's a phenomenal achievement of a department of uh, uh, Punjab Institute Patiara. I mean, I, I, don't think, uh, I don't think any other department, I may be ignorant that 10 uh, webinars uh, in a row have been organized, therefore do deserve appreciation of the highest order. After having said this, and I was listening to Professor Devinder Singh and also having a look upon the concept note. Now the focus of uh, this webinar was to cover different facets of the discipline of zoology and environmental science. The way you have selected uh, the resource person, they are from very prestigious uh, uh, institution, if I say so, powerhouses of knowledge, that they are from coming from powerhouses of knowledge, the way we are having today, Scott Solomon, I mean, they belong to elite uh, uh, institutions who are working in the cutting edge area of your discipline. Therefore, therefore, the way you have organized these, uh, these webinars, the way you have covered all facets of uh, uh, I mean, boundaries or the frontiers of your knowledge uh, of your discipline, I think, it's an excellent uh, um, and sort of a practice, the best practice which other department may like to emulate. Now, knowledge uh, is growing very fast, rather knowledge is growing at the speed of a thought. So is all disciplines, including duology and environmental science. Unfortunately, we people work in isolation, that, that we are so super specialized that we cannot understand even our specialization area within, within, uh, within uh, a specific discipline. Let me give an example of physics department from my previous university. We had a meeting. In that meeting, we invited head of the department and head of the department expressed his uh, inability to understand area of specialization and super specialization of physics that physician, that the students of physics have no communication channel to talk to each other. 
the, the students of political science, uh, local government and international relations have no communication channel to talk to each other. Therefore, we have become so super specialized and then isolated from reality. Now, let me give you three examples. New education policy in 2020. Spokesperson or spokes, uh, spokes document of interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary approach in, 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 all, uh, in all disciplines uh, of higher, higher education, colleges and universities. Therefore, I mean, there's another report by Jashpal Committee on Higher Education. Jashpal was former um, and, uh, chairman of University Grants Commission. Another committee, another other very, very excellent documented na knowledge, uh, National Knowledge Commission, Sam Petoda, who was the chairman of that. All these and many other report, reports and also now knowledge, I mean, now research, strongly suggest that we have to leave the artificial division of knowledge. We have to graduate beyond our boundaries. Now, if we are listening to uh, Professor uh, Scott today about agriculture and ants, now it is not an exclusive monopoly of a discipline because there is agriculture, there are ants, and there is the processes. When we come to the processes, then it becomes social science as well because processes can be understood only by the social scientist. Therefore, what I am suggesting that it's an excellent initiative. The Department of Joy, when I was reading uh, Dr. Bharti, your uh, concept note, okay. and you have uh, very, very eminently uh, highlighted that it's an age of interdisciplinary research. It's an age of multidisciplinary research. And you are Department of Geology and Environmental Science. Now, if you see environmental science, all disciplines are study environment. I mean, climate change is the biggest problem of the of, of the century. COVID-19 is the biggest challenge of the century. Now see how we can, I mean, unlayer, unfold COVID-19 until unless we listen from, initially we were told that it's a, it's a phenomenon to be studied by only medical experts. Then we come to know that psychologist is required. Then we come to know sociologist is required. Then we come to know the, I mean, the public policy maker is required. Then we come to know that administrators are, administrators, administrators are required because all, everything is done by the district administration. See, district administration is working more than all of us so far COVID-19 cases are concerned. Therefore, it's an interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary phenomenon. And hence, you have taken an initiative to, to start a series of webinars and a 10th in row, I think... Uh, uh, the, the way you have organized in a sequence, the way you're separating a message that no discipline can work in 21st century in, in, in isolation. Professor Dwinder, I know your son is working in the area of water, water resources. I'm reading his paper time and again, water resources is an interdisciplinary subject. Now, no discipline, let me, uh, I will stop just now. No discipline now is free from uh, technology. We are making use of a webinar through uh, through technology, and no discipline now is free from artificial intelligence, data analytics, data science. Therefore, where we are moving, we are moving towards evolving a common platform. We are not only science, not only languages, not only social science, all discipline across the globe. Not only this, Professor Scott, I will graduate further that we have to bring in practi practitioners in uh, professional on the scene. Until any theorists and professional join hands, we cannot understand the way this knowledge is being unfolded. With these, uh, um, I say I'm a student of social science and uh, being a student of social science, uh, uh, I cannot understand the intricacies of uh, I mean, uh, this, this, uh, this discipline about which uh, Professor uh, Professor Scott will just speak, but I know ants, I know agriculture. Professor uh, Devinder Singh, I used very, very, very good term, uh, food for our colonies. Now see, we are talking about food security. Let, let, me, let me listen to Professor Scott and learn something that how things are, how we can learn from environment around us. See, we always claim that human beings are the best uh, uh, I mean, uh, the best so far knowledge is concerned, we are totally mistaken. Let me cite last example, then I will stop. We have a Punjab Agriculture University, Ludhiana. And they, they are undertaking research in the field of agriculture. 
time and again i am emphasizing that if you want to learn agriculture you have to go to the farmer if you go to the farmer only then you can understand agriculture whereas devendar and i belong to an area where the farmer goes to his land i mean punjabi ko thudda maar ke dekh lenda bhi whether it's pat hai ya nahi oh i mean the 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 scientist will take soil to the lab will test it by the time it will come back uh, the the nature of the soil will change therefore farmer is the best practitioner professional to learn about agriculture halwa is the best to learn about how to make jalebi and so on and so forth i'm just giving crude example therefore what i'm suggesting all disciplines have to sit together practitioner and theorist have to sit together and then work in the uh, i mean uh, i mean uh, in in the area which are emerging area including in zoology and environmental science once again compliment congratulations appreciation of highest order to the department of zoology and environmental science this the way we are getting highest ranking if we are 26th fourth we are first 100 universities credit goes to you all and cumulative impact that we are becoming a leading university of india uh, congratulations and compliments and once again professor scott solomon uh, i welcome you to this platform and also express my sincere gratitude for agreeing to deliver lecture on on our selected theme thank you very much thank you sir yes sir now i i would like to introduce uh, professor scott solomon for his talk today so it's my singular pleasure to introduce dr scott solomon who teaches ecology evolutionary biology and scientific communication at rice university in houston professor solomon is also a research associate at the smithsonian institute's national museum of natural history He has a PhD in ecology, evolution, and behavior from the University of Texas at Austin, where his research examined the evolutionary basis of biological diversity in the Amazon basin. Dr. Solomon's current research examines the interactions between native and non-native ants, the impacts of extreme flooding on ant communities, ant foraging behavior, and the coevolution between ants and microbes. He is a member of American Association for Advancement of Science, the Society. for the study of evolution and he is on the editorial board of the journal of tropical ecology scott often speaks and writes about science at schools museums churches science cafes and ted events and other venues and ha has appeared on radio broadcasts on npr bbc and television series such as nasa's unexplained files and life 2 his writing and photography have appeared in publications such as nbc news state eon nautilus and wired and his book future humans inside the science of our continuing evolution published by the G yale university press was included in the 2017 best book list by the american association for the advancement of science so please join me in welcoming my dear friend professor scott solomon for today's talk Thank you so much for this wonderful introduction and the opportunity to to be with you all today. It's uh, truly an honor for me to have the opportunity to uh, to share with you a bit of of my research. Um, and I want to congratulate you as well on a wonderful webinar series. I think it's great what you all are doing to find a way for us all to stay connected during this challenging time and to continue to learn about science and. Uh, and share ideas and knowledge. I think we are all um, learning to appreciate even more the uh, the value of staying connected with one another and being able to share uh, ideas. And I think it's so important to continue to do that moving forward. So uh, I'm honored to be a part of of this series. Um, let me see if I can share my uh, slides with you quickly yeah. here. Okay, great. So, um, so I'm going to be talking today about a story that I have uh, personally been working on for um, about 20 years now, and um, is something that I, I I think is is interesting um, in its own right as uh, as as an interesting phenomenon in natural history. Um, 
but uh, also, as was pointed out in the introduction, might provide some interesting lessons for us humans as we think about the challenges uh, that we face in our own agricultural systems. Um, we're going to be discussing a group of ants that has been engaging in agriculture for about 50 million years and so might have a thing or two that, uh, that, that they can teach us about how to, to uh, engage in agriculture successfully. So I first became fascinated by fungus growing ants when I was a beginning graduate student and first visited the tropics in Central America, where I uh, first got to see these incredible ants known as leafcutter ants. So leafcutter ants are uh, the fungus growing ants that are, are the most familiar to, uh, to a wide range of people. They often appear on nature documentaries and books about natural history, and they really are just an, an amazing natural wonder. These are, uh, are ants that make enormous colonies. This is a picture of a, a somewhat younger version of me standing next to uh, just a spectacular single nest of leafcutter ants. This is one nest. Uh, this pile of sand here, uh, this is actually in Venezuela in a, um, a plantation of Caribbean pine trees. Um, and uh, there, these nests were everywhere, but this one particular one we thought was the most beautiful. Uh, but all of the sand was excavated from deep underground where these ants are cultivating their fungus. So each one of these small holes that you can just barely make out here uh, leads down to underground tunnels where there are these chambers that are uh, shown here. And um, each of these chambers could be about, uh, about a half a meter across in diameter. And they house this, uh, this white and gray spongy matter, which is actually the fungus that these ants are cultivating. Now, they get the name leafcutter ants because, of course, they do cut leaves. And uh, one of the things that is, is really just uh, an amazing sight to see is the uh, highways or uh, foraging trails of these leaf cutting ants after they have cut pieces of leaves from a wide variety of different types of plants and are transporting them back to their nest. So here um, you see another photo on the bottom left of one of these highways of leaf cutter ants, which can contain thousands of individuals moving back and forth. And the individuals that are moving towards the nest are carrying these fragments of leaves, which they have cut with their mandibles. Now they can't digest the leaf matter themselves. They don't have the enzymes necessary to be able to uh, process and digest leaf material on their own. So what they're doing is they're bringing these leaves underground um, and it will be sort of an assembly line style process where the foragers will drop a leaf near the, uh, inside, the leaf, uh, inside the entrance of the nest and other workers will retrieve it and bring it down deeper into the nest and distribute it among the various uh, chambers of fungus garden where they'll be incorporated into the matrix of this fungus garden. Uh, the fungus will then break down the uh, lignin and cellulose within that, uh, the leaf and will be able to, uh, the, the fungus actually provides the enzymes that, is needed to, that are needed to digest the, these leaves. And by doing that, they release the nutrients and make them available to the ants. So the ants are in effect using this fungus almost like an external digestive system to be able to make the uh, nutrients in the leaves available for, for the ants to be able to consume. Um, I mean, you can see a little bit of the scale of these nests just from uh, the photo here. One of these chambers, as I mentioned, about maybe a half meter in diameter at, um, at the greatest size. And there can be hundreds of these chambers inside one of these nests. So the scale of this is absolutely enormous. There can be uh, up to, a, we think about 5 million individual ants living inside one of these nests. So it really is like a city for ants. I mean, there's 5 million individual ants. They're growing their own food underground. Individual asks, uh, ants are engaging in different tasks, whether they're going out and cutting leaves uh, 
for retrieving leaves and bringing them underground, processing them, um, or uh, larger ants are known as soldiers and they're responsible for defending the nest. And then of course there's the queen who is uh, responsible for all of their reproduction. By the way, in a nest this size with those 5 million individual ants, in most species of leafcutter ants, there's only one single queen, which is just remarkable. So uh, lots of, uh, of egg laying happening by the queen. Uh, and the workers, of course, doing all of the other tasks. So this is the, the system that first captured my interest as a beginning graduate student. And as I said, it's the, you know, the most famous of the fungus growing ants, but not all fungus growing ants cut leaves. In fact, many of them are what we refer to as lower attine ants that engage in, um, a form of uh, fungal agriculture, much like the leafcutter ants, but their biology is completely different. So here I'm showing you um, a variety of different types of these lower attine ants. And uh, each of these has a much smaller nest size. On the left side here, you can see a cutaway of a nest of, uh, of lower attine ants. Uh, this is actually here in Texas near where I live. So you can see the surface of the ground here uh, once again, it's uh, uh, covered in, in pine needles. Um, this is a, a type of environment that many of these ant species really like. Uh, it has very well-drained sandy soil. So we've cut away here. And what you're looking at are two chambers. Here's a top chamber and here's a bottom chamber. And they're connected by a tunnel here. So we don't see the entrance to the, the colony at the top, but somewhere near here at the top, there'd be the entrance. There'd be a single tunnel going down to this one chamber and then another tunnel going down to another chamber. And that's it. There might be, in some cases, one or two more chambers, but uh, these are just a few centimeters across, maybe five, eight centimeters across. Uh, very simple, very small. In a nest like this, there might be a um, hundred ants, maybe 200. In some cases, they might get up into a thousand, but nothing like the scale of the millions of individual ants that we can find in uh, the leaf cutters. Um, in other species, like in the bottom right here, we see a nest of Apterostigma ants, another uh, lower attine ant in, um, in Central America. And this entire colony is on the bottom surface of a leaf. And this right here is its fungus garden. It actually creates a veil that is built out of fungal um, out, of, out of the fungi, out of the uh, mycelium of the fungus itself, and houses uh, the entire nest inside of that fungus. And in this case, it's uh, just um, a, a few dozen at most individual ants. So a much smaller, much simpler colony structure, much smaller colony size um, in these ants. Um, in the top right, you see a picture of another uh, lower attine ant. This is a Siphomermex ant. And uh, it is showing that they are not cultivating these fungus using leaves. They use any type of organic matter that they can find, uh, including in this case, caterpillar frass, caterpillar droppings, uh, one of the, their preferred uh, substrates for growing their fungus garden. So they'll, they'll find these materials, gather them up, and uh, use them to cultivate their fungus garden. So the lower attine ants, their biology again is nothing like the, uh, the leaf cutter ants, but they are still cultivating a fungus. So just to, to sort of um, describe this entire system that we're talking about here, we have ants that are um, bringing some sort of material, whether it's a, a piece of leaf or whether it is uh, a piece of caterpillar frass or whether it's sometimes uh, bits of insect exoskeleton, but they're bringing that and they're um, providing that to the fungus garden. The fungus garden is digesting and breaking that material down, making the nutrients within it accessible to the ants. So this is a mutualistic interaction in that the ants are clearly benefiting from the service that the fungus provides, but the fungus is also benefiting in that it is uh, being protected and it is being cultivated. It is being uh, provided with uh, material on which to, to grow. So it's a mutually beneficial interaction. 
Um, as we'll see in some of the fungus growing ants, the fungus is um, actually obligately dependent on the ants for cultivation. It cannot live outside of the nests of these ants. In other cases, they can. And uh, in the cases where they can, we've actually been able to collect individual mushrooms of um, fungus and genotype them and find that they are in fact genetically identical to the fungi that are being cultivated by the ants. So we know that in those cases, these ants are cultivating fungi that can live a free living existence, but they're being brought into this symbiosis, perhaps repeatedly, um, but we know that the, uh, the primary way that these ants acquire their symbionts is um, when a queen establishes a nest, she actually takes a small bit of the fungal tissue from the nest where she was, uh, was born, where she hatched, and uh, she will store it in a storage organ just inside her mouth called the infrabuckle pocket. And she will take that as she leaves the nest uh, to mate. She'll engage in a nuptial flight, mate with one or more males, and then go and find a place to establish her nest. When she does that, she will then uh, release this small pellet of fungal tissue, and that will then initiate the, um, the garden for her new nest as she begins to lay eggs that will develop into the first workers. So there's a vertical transmission uh, from one generation to the next of this fungus. And, um, and that's important for, uh, for the evolutionary story that we're gonna see in just a bit. But there's actually more to it than that. So we've got the fungal cultivar, as I mentioned, which is engaging in a mutualism with the ants. But there's also other participants, other microbial participants in the symbiosis. For example, there's a parasitic species of fungus in the genus Escovopsis. This uh, parasitic fungus, if it attacks the, uh, the cultivar, the fungal cultivar that the ants are growing for food, it can destroy the crop of these uh, ants. And if that happens, the nest can be destroyed. Um, as I mentioned, the, the, the ants depend on this fungus. Um, it's also the case that these ants cannot survive without their fungal garden. So if they lose their fungal crop to Escovopsis, the, uh, the ants will almost certainly die. So this uh, parasite is a really important player in this system because if it is allowed to, um, to grow on the fungal crop, the ants uh, are, are very likely to die. Um, so there's another participant in the symbiosis, which is a, actually a bacteria, a type of actinomycete bacteria, a few different uh, strains of actinomycete bacteria. And these produce antifungal compounds that have been shown to uh, inhibit the growth of the Escovopsis parasite. So in some cases, these ants uh, seem to be actually uh, encouraging the growth of these actinomycete bacteria on their exoskeleton and perhaps in other locations in the garden, uh, in the colony, because it helps to prevent the infection by this parasitic fungus. So we have all of these different interactants, the ants, the uh, uh, fungus that they're growing as food, <clears throat> the fungal parasite, and the uh, actinomycete bacteria that is um, providing a, um, a sort of natural um, <clears throat> pesticide in a, in a way. Now, if we look at the <clears throat> evolutionary history of the fungus growing ants, we can see some, some interesting patterns. So first of all, um, the, all of the, uh, the uh, lineages here that are shown in, um, in these colored boxes belong to the group known as the fungus growing ants or the atine ants. And as you can see, there are uh, quite a few species of them, about 270 or so described species with other undescribed species uh, remaining that need, uh, need some attention. Um, and uh, if we trace the evolutionary history of this group, it goes back to about 55 to 65 million years ago. Um, so the origin of fungus growing is something that um, has been of interest to a lot of folks. I'm not going to talk so much about the origin of fungus growing today, um, although that's an interesting topic <clears throat> in and of itself. What I want to highlight here is that within the group of fungus growing ants, there are five different agricultural systems. Um, I've already spoken about a couple of these. I discussed the lower agriculture, which is the 
uh, the most basal form of um, agriculture within the Attine ants, meaning that it is the form that we believe was the first to evolve um, and is still the form that is, that is practiced by um, a, a great number of these Attine ants scattered uh, across the phylogeny here, um, including several different genera. And we've talked about the leafcutter ant agricultural system, which is shown here um, at the bottom in this orange color. There are two genera, by the way, of leafcutter ants, Atta and Acromermex. <clears throat> um, but as you can see, there are a few other types of agricultural systems that have evolved, including one called a uh, coral fungus agriculture. This is actually the example that I showed underneath the leaf. So that is actually a distinct form of, um, of fungal agriculture <clears throat> where the, uh, the, the ants are actually cultivating a, um, a phylogenetically distinct form of fungus. And those are ants in the genus Apterostigma. Um, and then there's also uh, the um, Siphomermex uh, ants that are engaging in a form of agriculture that is, uh, is quite interesting in this case the fungus is being cultivated not as a mycelium, but as a yeast. So it's actually the same type of fungus that is being cultivated, but these ants are cultivating it as a single-celled yeast rather than as a multicellular um, a, um, a form. So, so we don't yet understand the, uh, the benefits uh, that might come to the ants from growing these uh, fungi as a yeast, but it is uh, a phylogenetically distinct group of ants that are capable of doing that. And so that is quite interesting as well. And then the, uh, the other form of um, agriculture within the fungus growing ants is what we refer to as higher agriculture. And higher agriculture is um, actually uh, the, uh, includes leaf cutter agriculture as a subset but in higher agriculture, what we're talking about now is ants that are cultivating a uh, domesticated version of the fungus. Now, when I say domesticated, what I mean is that these are the fungi that are not capable of living outside of the nests of these ants. So they've been domesticated in the sense that they rely on the ants for their survival. They also, like in the domestication of, um, of crop plants and, and livestock um, by humans, they show signs of adaptation, ways that they have been perhaps selectively bred to enhance their suitability and their edibility. And I'll show some examples of that um, in just a moment. Um, and as I said, the leaf cutter symbiosis is actually a subset of that higher symbiosis, higher uh, symbiosis agriculture. Um, so these are the different types of uh, agricultural systems that we see within the fungus growing ants. And what I wanna do today is talk about some of the transitions that occurred from one form of uh, agriculture to another. And I'm gonna be focusing, um, show this phylogeny again, zoomed in a bit here. I'm gonna be focusing in on uh, the transition between lower and higher agriculture um, and then um, in a bit, we'll talk about the transition from higher agriculture to leaf cutter agriculture. So I've highlighted here that there um, is a group of ants that occupies a very interesting phylogenetic position right at the boundary between the lower uh, attine agriculture and the um, higher agriculture. And so because of that, uh, this group of ants is one uh, that we have been quite interested in. It's uh, a group known as Mycetogroicus. And as you see here, it, the form of agriculture that they engage in was actually unknown when we started uh, this, this research. And so uh, in order to understand this transition from lower to higher agriculture, we need to understand whether these um, particular ants are engaging in a lower or higher uh, agriculture. So Mycetogroicus is a group of uh, four described species of ants um, that were described actually from museum specimens in 2001. And because they were described from museum specimens, almost nothing was known about their biology, about their natural history. Um, including whether they cultivated uh, 
their fungus in using a lower agriculture or a higher uh, uh, form of agriculture. Um, so I was fortunate to work with a great team of uh, Brazilian colleagues. The, uh, this particular group of ants um, lives in Brazil. And so uh, I've been working for uh, quite a few years now with uh, this group of uh, wonderful Brazilian colleagues, Mauricio Bacci Jr., Geraldo Vasconcelos, Cauê Lopez, and Andre Rodriguez. And uh, what we did was we um, were able to locate some nests of Mycida groicus, thanks to uh, Geraldo and his uh, colleagues who have a great field station in uh, Uberlandia um, in uh, central Brazil. And they had actually found some of these ants uh, walking around on the surface of the ground. And we were able to go back to that field site. And after a few days, we uh, were able to follow some of these ants back to one of their nest entrances, which uh, you can see here. So this is the entire nest entrance. It's just a very small uh, pile of, of uh, soil pellets here. You can see pretty inconspicuous, easy to miss. Um, and so uh, once we found uh, a few of these nests, we began the excavation. The excavation was uh, a pretty uh, time consuming. It actually took about four days of digging um, to get to the bottom of uh, some of these uh, nests. And um, this is work that was done as well with uh, some of my other close colleagues and collaborators. So Ulrich Mueller, um, who was my uh, PhD dissertation supervisor at University of Texas, uh, and Ted Schultz, who would later become my postdoctoral supervisor at the Smithsonian Institution, uh, both of whom have uh, spent most of their careers studying fungus growing ants and the, the agriculture that they engage in um, and are also very good diggers. So we dug these uh, holes, we, we located four individual nests and uh, began to excavate them. As I said, it took uh, several days of excavation. Here's me at the bottom of one of these holes uh, digging. This is um, about three uh, meters or three and a half meters uh, below ground, uh, trying to trace this very narrow tunnel. So you can see here on the uh, right side, this where I'm showing here is the actual tunnel that the ants have excavated. It's just this very thin, you know, maybe uh, one centimeter or so wide um, uh, tunnel that the ants dig. And you have to, to follow this. If you don't, uh, if you don't trace this, it's, it's almost impossible to figure out where the ants are going. So you'll do these little tricks like taking a small blade of grass and inserting it into the tunnel and then digging away um, to the side and gradually exposing this tunnel in order to reveal uh, the, where it's going. And so we went down and down and down and down. And um, eventually at a little more than three and a half meters underground, we finally found uh, a chamber that contained fungus garden. Now, this was of course very exciting. Nobody had ever seen one of the uh, fungus gardens cultivated by this genus of ants before. And uh, we were able to take some samples, keep it uh, alive, uh, as well as take some samples for genetic analyses. So here you see a photo of the ants in their uh, garden. And um, we look at this under a microscope, we can actually see the fungal mycelia. And here is where one of the key features of uh, domestication of this fungus becomes really important because if you look at the tips of the hyphae, so this is a, a strand, a hyphal strand of fungus here. And at the tip, this is where we can tell whether this is um, a, a domesticated form of this fungus or not because what we see in the domesticated form is that the tips of these hyphal strands have become swollen. They become enlarged in a structure that is known as gungolidia. And this is one of the adaptations that these fungi have evolved to make them more suitable for agriculture. So in almost the, the same way as uh, in human agriculture, we have grown our crops selectively to enhance the, uh, the edible portion. So we grow larger fruits, larger vegetables, We've enhanced those, uh, those parts of those plants. Um, in a, what appears to be a similar way, these ants have encouraged the growth of fungi that have a enlarged edible portions. But we don't see that here 
in this particular fungus. These hyphal strands uh, simply terminate the way uh, a, a normal fungus would. So this suggested that this is probably not a form of the domesticated fungus and might instead be an example of lower atine agriculture. And once we were able to sequence uh, DNA from these fungi, that was actually confirmed. Uh, so if we take a look here, we can see uh, this Mycetogroicus ceridensis, this particular species that we um, had excavated and, and found the fungus chamber of. It actually fits nicely into one of the previously known clades or, or groups here of uh, lower atine cultivars. So there are these uh, two different groups, phylogenetically distinct groups of uh, lower atine cultivars. And, uh, and this one did fit nicely into that one particular group. So this suggested that uh, we can say that Mycetogroicus, which again sits at the transition between lower and higher insect agriculture, in fact, is an example of lower agriculture. So this was very satisfying. Uh, but then it just makes us that much more interested in understanding more about the species that occupy the other side of the transition here and are engaging in higher atine agriculture so that we can better understand this transition. And that is a group uh, which until recently was all known as uh, the genus Trachymyrmex. And Trachymyrmex is a much bigger genus that includes um, about 49 described species. It has a very wide geographic range. And I think I, I'm realizing now, I, I failed to mention an important point earlier about the fungus growing ants in general, which is that they all live in, uh, the, uh, in the Americas. So in North, Central, and South America, they are exclusive to that uh, part of the world with the greatest diversity uh, occurring in Central and, and South America. Um, Trachymyrmex occupies that entire range. So unlike Mycetogroicus, which is only known from a few places in Brazil, uh, Trachymyrmex makes it as far North as uh, New York, um, in the United States and uh, all the way down south um, to Argentina in South America. That's a very wide geographic range. And in fact, uh, what we know of the biology of this group is that they can occupy diverse ecosystems. Uh, they can use a wide range of different um, types of, uh, of substrates to, to cultivate their fungus. And in some ways they appear to be intermediate between the leaf cutters and the, um, the lower atine ants in that while they often use organic matter to cultivate their fungus, they have been seen on occasion to use pieces of fresh leaves, much like leafcutter ants. So understanding the origin of leafcutter agriculture is, uh, uh, requires us to understand more about this one particular group. Um, the problem is that many of the species within this group, um, much like Mycetogroicus, are just very poorly known. We know about them from museum specimens, a few studies here and there, uh, but with the exception of uh, some of the species that um, have been well studied, we, we know very little about the others. So uh, once again, with uh, uh, much of the same group of collaborators, um, I set out to, to better understand the um, the basic biology, natural history, as well as uh, evolutionary history of uh, trachymyrmex. So we have the same team here of Brazilian collaborators. Um, and um, again, Ted Schultz from the Smithsonian Institution, Ulrich Mueller from University of Texas, um, as well as a few other uh, folks, uh, Christian Robling, um, who is originally from Germany, is now a, a professor at um, Arizona State University, uh, and Jeffrey Sosa Calvo, who uh, is originally from Columbia. Um, and so this whole team was uh, wonderful to work with, and we were able to amass an incredible collection of different species of trachymyrmex. Uh, many of these were original collections that, that we uh, collected out in the field, but others came from uh, museum specimens. As you can see here, uh, this span the entire geographic range of trachymyrmex from 13 different countries um, and included uh, 112 samples of ants and 153 samples 
of the fungi that they cultivate. Uh, just to give you a little bit of an overview of what some of these ants look like, you can see some of them here. On the top left, this is a male. So in, um, in ants, the males um, typically have wings. They actually look a lot like wasps, which ants are, are derived from wasps. So um, that's not a coincidence. Um, you can see uh, the group of ants known as trachymermex have this kind of bumpy appearance here. They have these tubercles with other tubercles growing on them. Uh, one of the distinctive traits. And um, if we look at their nest entrances, we've seen a couple of examples of what the nests of these ants look like. In this case, they're quite diverse. So you get something that looks like what we've seen before, where it's sort of a pile of a soil that's been excavated and brought to the surface. But we see a lot of other things as well. In some species, they have these little turrets that are formed from um, small pieces of grass and leaves. Um, here's an example of uh, a turret like that where the side has uh, broken open and you can see the ant uh, peeking out from inside there. Um, in other cases, the nest entrances are completely discrete. So this here is actually the entrance to a nest of one of these species. Um, but the only way that you would know that is by seeing an ant actually entering the nest or exiting the nest. Otherwise, there's nothing there that gives it away as being a nest entrance. Um, so um, we, we performed our usual excavation of these nests and, uh, and, and uh, luckily they, most of them are not as deep as Mycetogroicus, so we didn't have to go three and a half meters down to find a sample of their fungus garden. Here you can see only about 10 centimeters underground with the nest entrance here. Uh, you've got the little grass turret and you can see the fungus garden uh, just beneath uh, the surface here in a fairly large chamber. Here's another one where part of the tunnel is exposed and you can see the chamber here. So luckily uh, the excavations of, of many of these species were, were much more straightforward and we were able to get quite a few of the fungal samples. Okay, so let's talk about uh, what we've, what we've uh, found from this group. So this is a, a phylogenetic analysis of um, four nuclear genes. And um, what we see is that, in fact, this genus of, uh, which was known as trachymermax, really is three distinct groups. So uh, I've shown them now in three um, slightly different colors. All of this is what was previously known as trachymermax. And what we were able to show, uh, which had been suggested by some previous analyses as well, is that in fact, these really are three evolutionarily distinct groups. Um, and in a publication that came out last year, we have now described them as, um, as separate genera. So um, <clears throat> the most basal group here, uh, we've given the name Mycetomalarius. Um, and uh, we'll look more at this, uh, each of these individual genera in just a moment. Um, this uh, clade here uh, is, uh, we've given the name paratrachymermex. And then the clade here at the bottom has retained the name trachymermex because it was the original, uh, the, the species within this group was the, the, um, among the first to be given the name trachymermex. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, each of these groups just briefly here. So I wanna highlight that this um, group here the Mycetomalarius is the group that is, um, uh, you know, it, it basically uh, the sister group to all of the other uh, trach formerly uh, trachymermex ants and also the leaf cutters. So it, in some ways, this is the most basal group here. Um, so it contains 30 described species. Um, based on our analyses, uh, it appears there are at least eight undescribed species. These are, um, uh, what appear to be evolutionarily distinct lineages. Um, our initial morphological um, observations suggest that they have some distinct morphological characteristics as well, um, but uh, additional work will be required to formally describe those as uh, distinct species. Uh, this is a group that primarily lives in uh, habitats in South and Central America that are seasonally dry. Some of these species also occur on Caribbean islands um, and in uh, the Southern United States as well. 
a paratrachy myrmex. So um, this is a, a, a group that contains uh, nine described species, at least two undescribed species. And this is a group that uh, seems to mostly occur in wet forest habitats in uh, Central and South America. And then uh, trachymermex, um, trachymermex sensu stricto, or the uh, trachymermex uh, that uh, uh, is continuing to be uh, called trachymermex, contains nine described species. Um, and these species occur mostly in uh, the northern part of the range of uh, fungus growing ants. And that includes uh, North America as well as uh, Mexico. And in fact, uh, we have uh, several of these species living uh, right outside my, my door here. So um, it's fun to be able to, to walk outside and, and see these. Most of them are in the tropics. So I, I enjoy having them close by. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the fungi that are cultivated by, by these ants. Um, so when we take a look at our, our phylogenetic analysis here, uh, first of all, we can see the lower attine fungi um, in this uh, basal clade here. And then there are these two distinct clades of higher attine fungi. We call them clade A and clade B. Clade A was traditionally thought to have been exclusive to the leafcutter ants, whereas clade B was thought to be uh, a form of higher attine fungi cultivated by non-leafcutter ants. So trachymermex, and there's a few other genera of higher attine ants that I haven't, I haven't talked about. But we used to, to think that there was this distinction between uh, leafcutter fungi and fungi cultivated by non-leafcutter ants that are still domesticated, still have those swollen uh, tips at their hyphae, et cetera. Our, uh, our study, though, has, is, uh, is showing that that distinction is not so clear cut. Um, so what we actually see is that there are uh, several higher attines that are growing a lower, what we thought was a lower attine fungus. Those are the, uh, the uh, sequences that are highlighted here with these purple arrows. <clears throat> so these are uh, species in the former trachymermex that are, are actually growing a lower attine fungus. Um, at the same time, if we look at the clade A, the so-called leafcutter cultivars, what we see there is that there are also some of uh, the uh, higher attine ants, the non leaf cutters that are actually growing what we thought was a uh, leaf cutter fungus. So these distinctions into these distinct clades of, uh, of different groups of fungi are not absolute. Um, so to summarize this, this part of the talk, what we've uh, done here is we've, um, we've put together the most extensive molecular phylogenetic study so far of a higher attine ants of trachymermex in particular, and shown that this uh, group trachymermex is in fact um, three distinct lineages, which again, we've given uh, new genus names to mycetomalarius, paratrachymermex, uh, and trachymermex, and contain uh, other sp new species that need to be formally described. Um, but importantly, the distinctions that we thought existed between these different types of fungi are really not absolute. And I think that gives us some insight into these transitions between one type of agriculture and another. It's not such a clear cut case of um, ants evolving to simply uh, engage in a particular form of agriculture and then all of their descendants performing that exact same type of agriculture. It seems there were stops and starts, and uh, perhaps because these ants can sometimes incorporate other fungi into their gardens, they might sometimes switch and start cultivating a different form of fungus. But that's a, a phenomenon that we really don't understand. We don't know how that actually happens in nature. We can only uh, see that it must happen from time to time based on these uh, molecular phylogenies. Um, I also wanna just talk briefly about the, the parasitic fungus. Because as I mentioned, this parasite Escavopsis is, um, is a really important part of the symbiosis. And if it attacks the fungal cultivar, it can completely destroy the colony. We also uh, have for a long time known that these uh, Escavopsis parasites have co-evolved along with 
both the ants and their fungal cultivar. So we see these congruent patterns in the phylogenies of the ants, the fungal cultivar, at least to a certain extent, right? And uh, the parasite Escavopsis. And in our, st <coughs> our, um, our studies, we were fortunate, uh, thanks mostly to the work of Andre Rodriguez, who is a very talented uh, microbiologist, microbial ecologist. Uh, we were able to actually isolate um, some Escavopsis from some of the colonies that we sampled um, in the field. And, and this is all the work that was done in Brazil. Um, and so we were able to get uh, Escavopsis from uh, seven species of the former trachea myrmex, as well as from um, some of the other species of these fungus growing ants. And this actually revealed quite a bit of new diversity within the uh, Escavopsis parasites. Um, so actually now we're recognizing um, quite a few different distinct clades of uh, Escavopsis. Um, and this is something that requires quite a bit more research because it's difficult to, to study these. You can't simply just go out and, and grab some Escavopsis. It has to be cultivated uh, from fungus that is uh, being grown in the ant's nest that is taken into the lab and then kept in, um, in uh, culture for some time. And then if you're lucky, some of this Escavopsis might be able to be isolated. Um, and so work by uh, Lucas Morelis, um, former student of Andre Rodriguez, he uh, was really good at, at teasing apart some of these uh, Escavopsis parasites and then, uh, and then sequencing their DNA to reveal this additional diversity here within this group. Okay, so I want to, um, to, to actually uh, pivot now and, um, and change topics and talk just for a little bit in the time that we have left about some of the other projects that, um, that I've been working on in, in, in recent years. Um, so as you heard in the introduction, one of the things that I've been interested in recently is uh, native and non-native ants and how they're interacting um, here in Southeast Texas where I live. We have uh, two particular species of ants here in, in my region that uh, are uh, sort of notorious as non-native pests. Those include the red imported fire ant, Solenopsis invicta, which was accidentally introduced from South America to North America in the early 20th century, and Nylandaria fulva, known as the tawny crazy ant, uh, which was introduced from South America more recently um, in uh, early 2000s. And this is work that um, is part of a collaboration with uh, the folks that you see here, uh, particularly Tom Miller, as well as uh, Sarah Bankston and Michael Saucedo. Um, so we have been studying uh, the ant communities in East Texas in a region known as the Big Thicket for about the last five or six years. And this is a region that um, is, um, is, is interesting for a number of reasons. It's a very diverse, region biologically. Uh, you get organisms that um, normally aren't found in, together in a close association found together in this region. Um, and from a conservation perspective, um, it's got a, a sort of an interesting setup in which you have these different units of conservation shown here in green that are connected by these very narrow river corridors. And what we've been doing is going to each of these different units. Uh, you can see our sampling locations here shown by these red stars and following these ant communities over time. Uh, our initial studies were um, using pitfall traps, just a uh, 50 milliliter tube placed in the ground with some uh, soapy water to capture these ants. Uh, and you leave them there for, uh, for some amount of time, a couple of days or a week, and then come back and retrieve them. Um, and by doing this, we were able to sort of track these communities of ants over time. And what we saw is that there's a little bit of seasonal variation uh, from spring to fall, for example. But from one year to the next, there didn't seem to be a whole lot of difference in these ant communities. Um, however, what we found is that there was a big difference in the ant communities based on whether or not the crazy ant, Nylandaria fulva, is present. So in areas where Nylandaria fulva is present, you find almost no other ants whatsoever. And in fact, one of the only ants, the only ant that we found um, in association with this ant 
is actually one of the fungus growers. So this is where the two stories briefly come together. Um, it's actually the, uh, the yeast growing form of uh, Siphomermex. Uh, and so it could be that that's simply not uh, competing for resources with, with um, these crazy ants. And perhaps that's why they're able to coexist. But in places where we don't see these crazy ants, we see a diverse community that includes many native species of ants, as well as um, a few other non-natives like fire ants. Um, so this is a video. I just want to give you a sense of what it's like to be at one of the sites where these crazy ants occur. So everything that you see walking across the surface of the ground here is one of these crazy ants, tawny crazy ants, Nylandaria fulva. So in the places where this ant exists, they absolutely dominate the ecosystem. And um, it's really just remarkable. Every surface that you look at, whether it's the ground or a tree trunk or a leaf, if you watch it for more than a couple of seconds, you'll see one of these ants crawl across it. They're just absolutely everywhere. But then in 2017, almost exactly three years ago, we had a very devastating um, natural disaster here in, in our region. Uh, Hurricane Harvey came ashore and um, it was an unusual storm in that rather than um, uh, hitting and moving away, uh, like most hurricanes do, it lingered over Southeast Texas for about five days. And this brought catastrophic rains to our region. Uh, as you can see here, um, there were areas that got um, <clears throat> uh, in excess of 40 inches of rain in just a few days. Um, and this caused uh, flooding on a scale that was just unprecedented in, um, in history in our area. So uh, this was a, a, a certainly a natural disaster for, for people, um, including for myself. Actually, my house was flooded and destroyed in Hurricane Harvey. So it was a personal uh, tragedy. Uh, but scientifically, we we're able to try to take advantage of this by asking, well, what happens to ants uh, in such a devastating flood. Um, and because we had been going and studying these ant communities uh, throughout uh, the last several years before Hurricane Harvey, it gave us the opportunity to go back to those same sites and look at what those ant communities were doing after such a devastating flood. So if we look um, pre-Harvey, I already showed you these data here. This is the num just the number of different ant species. What we saw is that um, in the year following the floods from Hurricane Harvey, there was um, a, a decline in the number of ant species present in those communities. But by a year later, those ant communities had actually returned to um, the, the, the comparable number of species that they had uh, previously. So highlighting the resilience that these ant communities have in the face of um, extreme, extreme flooding. Um, if we look at the percentage of those ant species that were invasive, um, it shows a similar story. What we saw is that uh, the um, uh, species were basically wiped out in the immediate aftermath of Hurricane Harvey, but that they had recovered in the following year to look very similar to the way they had uh, prior to Hurricane Harvey. Um, we can also look at particular ant species like the uh, red imported fire ant. And um, what we see is that if you look at the, the percentage of the sites that were invaded by these fire ants, there was once again a decline and a recovery. Now for these fire ants, it was not so surprising to us because fire ants actually have an interesting adaptation in which they can actually form uh, rafts of living ants that can survive floods. So what these ants do is they actually link their bodies together <clears throat> by grabbing onto one another with their legs and they can actually float on the surface of floodwaters and, um, and they can make it to high ground and actually save the nest by doing that. And we knew about this beforehand. So we expected that perhaps these fire ants won't be quite so badly affected as other species, but most ants can't do that. So we expected other ants would be uh, much worse off. On the other hand, the, uh, the tawny crazy ants appeared to be um, largely unaffected by this as well. So it's really kind of remarkable, again, to see the resilience of these ant communities. I just want to highlight one particular site um, where we've done some of this work. Um, this is a place called Edgewater Park in the Big Thicket National Preserve. It's this peninsula 
right here. So it's a fairly small area <clears throat> and, it, um, and it does receive uh, regular floods. I just wanna show you a picture. This is not from Hurricane Harvey. This is a video rather um, of what this site looks like. This is actually the trail. I'm walking along the trail here. And this was another big rain event that happened uh, recently. <clears throat> and so you can see how much water um, this particular area gets. So hard to imagine how ants, which are nesting underground, are able to survive in, um, in such an extreme situation, and yet somehow they do. And if we do you know, sort of a finer scale study of this particular site uh, following Hurricane Harvey, and what we saw is that uh, is actually there's a, a, a fine, fine scale geographic distinction between different parts of this area in terms of the presence of these different species. At the tip of the peninsula, it seemed to be more dominated <clears throat> by Nylandaria fulva, the, the tawny crazy ant. Whereas um, over here on the um, uh, other side, we saw um, more of the fire ants and we did not see any of these uh, Nylandaria. <clears throat> and what you can see is that there's some native ants that are intermixed um, within here, although they tend to be um, less common in places where some of these, <clears throat> excuse me, where some of these, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> where some of these non-native species have become established. But interestingly enough, when we followed over the next year, what we saw is that eventually by a year after Hurricane Harvey, these crazy ants actually disappeared from our study site. So it wasn't immediately in the aftermath of the flooding. It was a year later, all of a sudden, the uh, Nylandaria fulva had uh, vanished from our study site. You can see they were extremely abundant um, earlier that year. They were declining by about a month later. And <clears throat> um, by uh, mid-July, these uh, crazy ants had completely disappeared. I showed you that video earlier of how abundant they were. And so you can get a sense of how unusual and surprising it was for us to find that these ants had completely vanished. This is still a mystery that we don't, um, we don't understand. We don't know uh, what has happened to them. If there was uh, any relationship to uh, the flooding from Hurricane Harvey or whether it was something else that wiped these ants out. Uh, but one way or another, they appear to be gone. We'll be sampling them again. Um, shortly to, to see if they're still gone. But uh, ever since then, when we've gone back, we've not seen them. Um, if I have time, I just want to tell you uh, just you know uh, one or two other quick stories here. This is uh, something that was a, a spinoff of this project that I was just uh, telling you about. Um, it was one of these accidental discoveries that, that happens from time to time in science, but is, is one of the fun things about doing science. Uh, while we were studying these ants in the big thicket and trying to understand native and non-native ant dynamics, um, one of my students noticed that uh, if we put a bait out to attract some of these ants, that um, some of them would, um, the baits themselves, we were using honey as bait, the bait would start to appear dirty. And my students said, you know, these ants, they're just so dirty. Every time they show up, the, the honey gets all dirty and I don't know what's going on. And we watched these and what we realized is that what these ants were doing is actually bringing pieces of dry leaf and small pieces of soil and small sticks and placing it into the honey. And then going back later and retrieving those pieces and then carrying them away. And so it turns out that what these ants are doing is act actually using these materials as like a sponge to soak up the honey and allow them to transport it back to the nest where they can share it with uh, their nest mates and their, their larvae. So this is actually an example of tool use in ants. Um, it was, uh, we were not the first to, to, to witness this or to, or to discover it. Um, I wasn't aware of this behavior at the time and I got very excited about it and immediately started to look up, okay, what's known about this? Uh, and there have been some other studies that have looked at this behavior in this group of ants. It's in the genus of Phenogaster. Um, but there's still very little that is known about this behavior. And so um, another student of mine is an undergraduate student at, at Rice University named Alice Gong. Uh, got really fascinated by this behavior and has been um, 
uh, trying to study it in, in some more detail by bringing some of these colonies of ants into the lab um, and, and conducting some behavioral observations and experiments. Uh, so uh, just briefly what, uh, what her experimental setup involves is having um, a nest box here uh, where the ants uh, keep their larvae. And um, then she will put out a, uh, a honey uh, bait as a form of, of food and she will provide them with different types of uh, tools. These are different um, types of materials. She experimented with trying different things, but uh, ultimately found that uh, pine needles are uh, a tool that they prefer to use and that work pretty effectively. So she would provide them with some uh, cut up pieces of pine needles and then um, make observations to see if they would actually use these pine needles to soak up this honey. And what she found is something uh, kind of interesting here. What she found is that um, all of the workers are capable of using tools to retrieve food, but that some of these ants seem to have a much more of a tendency to do so than others. So it's not the case that all of these ants are interchangeable within the colony, even though they don't have any obvious morphological differences from one ant to another, they seem to have some individuals that are more inclined to be what she refers to as specialists, as tool users that will uh, very quickly use uh, these pine needles to soak up food and retrieve it. Whereas others are uh, much more reluctant to do so. And what she found is that if you remove those tool users that do so readily from the colony, uh, you can then observe what the other workers will do. And what she found is that um, when you remove them, that, uh, that the number of individuals that will use tools eventually starts to grow. So these other ants will take on that task and begin to use tools uh, but it takes them some time to do that. She also interestingly found that the number of callow workers, which are newly hatched workers that are using tools, started to increase as she performed these trials. So what this is suggesting to us is that perhaps these ants are uh, innately equipped with the ability to uh, use these tools rather than observing other ants within the colony using these tools because they've, again, she's removed the ones that were, were using tools and then observing these newly emerged workers as they are starting to use tools. So suggesting that learning is probably not an important part of, um, of the behavior here uh, that appears to be an innate um, behavioral tendency. Okay, very last thing I just wanna briefly talk about, um, and this is uh, going back to the, the leaf cutter ants. Another really fun collaboration that uh, started unexpectedly. I was having lunch on campus at Rice one day, I was introduced to a visitor from, uh, from um, Costa Rica, who's actually a physicist who told me that uh, he was very interested in uh, the, the um, ways that traffic patterns emerge in uh, highways and on sidewalks and was curious about why it is that ants don't have traffic jams. And so we started a collaboration to try to understand what it is that ants are doing that prevents them from having the same types of traffic jams that we have on, uh, on our highways around the world. Um, and so what they were able to show is that uh, with a mathematical model, it's quite simple to predict uh, when traffic will occur based on, um, on the density and the flow rate of uh, particles, which could be cars or could be pedestrians or could be individual ants. Um, but we wanted to understand what ants do that doesn't cause this same phenomenon to occur. And so this led to a very fun collaboration in which uh, we went down to um, some of the field sites in Costa Rica in the rainforest and um, made some observations and some experiments of leafcutter ants on those foraging highways. What you're looking at here is one of our setups where we introduced an obstacle right in the middle of the foraging column of these ants that has only uh, two small slits here to allow ants to go back and forth. And as you can see, there's a very small uh, backup, a, a local congestion right here at this site, but it does not cause a traffic backup further back along the trail the way this would if something like this happened on, on one of our highways. I can certainly say here in Houston, 
um, you know, where we've got some bad traffic problems. If something like this happened, it would cause a traffic backup for, for miles and miles and miles. So we're trying to understand what it is uh, that ants are doing here. We think it probably has something to do with their pheromone trails, but we don't yet uh, fully understand what's going on. Um, but I just want to emphasize uh, how, how fun it is to do collaborations that go across uh, different academic disciplines. Uh, this was mentioned in the um, in the introduction, and I think I, this is, is so true. And for me personally, uh, the opportunity to do research uh, with a group of physicists was something very novel for me. Um, it was a lot of fun to go out into the field with a group of physicists. This was uh, something totally new to them. Um, and the way that they would approach a problem that we were facing and in, in trying to conduct this research was a, a completely different way of thinking about that problem than the way that I would approach this as, you know, a, a biologist. And so, um, I, you know, this is just one of those things where I think the more that people from different disciplines get together and talk and try to work on problems together, the more creative and interesting solutions that, that we all will find. So this is still uh, an ongoing project, so I don't have uh, much in the way of results to report, but I just wanted to share that um, uh, that story. I think it's 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 a going to be a fun one to continue to work on, and I'm excited to see what what comes next. So, with that, um, I just want to acknowledge uh, some of the funding sources that have supported the work that um, that I've been talking about, including in particular the National Science Foundation, um, some of the institutions that uh, I've worked and some of my collaborators have worked with. Um, and I want to uh, thank you all for, for your attention and for uh, joining me today. Um, if you would like to learn more about any of uh, the work that I do, uh, anything I've talked about today, as well as other projects, um, I have a lot of information on my website. Uh, feel free to send me an email, follow me on Twitter, Instagram, et cetera. Um, and I hope I've left some time for questions. So thank you very much. Uh Thank you, Scott, for your very, very illustrated and uh, uh, talk on the basis of your personal experience with ants. And uh, you delivered this talk on the third anniversary of uh, uh, Hurricane Harvey, which damaged some of your properties, but it gave you some uh, special opportunities to study ant behavior. Uh, I have got uh, a long list of questions from our students, particularly two of our students, uh, Opaninder and Hasimran. They are very inquisitive and they always ask very interesting questions. So I am trying to compile up all those questions in the form of a list. So I'll go one by one. So uh, first question is, uh, some termites, some termites have microorganisms like uh, trichonympha in their gut for digestion of cellulose. So what might be the reason for these ants to have evolved this external digestion rather than internal digestion? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So, um, so the question, if it's possible for some insects like termites, for example, to have internal uh, microorganisms that can aid in the digestion, why have an external system? Um, and yes, that's a great point. So we do know that uh, termites, of course, are, are famous for being able to digest um, wood and other plant matter. Um, that is a, a, a pretty unusual symbiosis that termites have in that there are not many other insects that um, have, uh, have evolved that, um, that particular repertoire of uh, um, gut microbial microorgan uh, gut microorganisms that allow them to do that. So I think if the ancestors of uh, fungus growing ants had uh, evolved such an internal symbiosis, then perhaps they would not ever have engaged in this particular uh, type of agriculture. But I think because they didn't, this was another way of accomplishing that. But I also wanna mention that there are other insects that engage in uh, fungal agriculture that I didn't talk about. So the fungus growing ants, are one of the best known, but there are also fungus growing termites. So this particular group of termites that grow fungi in a way that is very similar to the way the fungus growing ants um, cultivate their, their uh, fungi. Uh, one of the big differences in the termites though is that there is not vertical transmission. So in the termites, they have to newly acquire those fungi each generation. 
Whereas the, in the ants, those queens, as I mentioned, uh, take a bit of the fungus from their, their natal nest and bring it with them to as they form a new nest. And, um, and so the fact that it's not vertical transmission affects to a certain extent some of the evolutionary dynamics within that group. Uh, there's also a few species of beetles that engage in a, a type of a fungal agriculture. So those are the only three uh, insect groups that we know about that engage in a fungal agriculture. Um, so it is a, a fairly unusual trait, but as, as was pointed out, um, it's a, another way of accomplishing the ability to digest things if you don't have the right uh, entourage of, of microbes living in your gut, I suppose. Uh, uh, another question is that, uh, how are the worker ants able to get their fungal garden rid of any weed fungi that may rise? Yes, so this is a, a good question. The, the ants are um, very diligent gardeners. So there are constantly ants patrolling the garden and searching for any types of foreign microbes that don't belong there. Uh, they keep the nests remarkably clean um, and they actually have refuse chambers um, often uh, in a separate location inside the nest or in some species outside of the nest. They actually bring out the trash and deposit it outside of the colony and they do a good job of keeping that um, uh, debris, trash, exhausted fungal substrate apart from the live fungi. Um, and that probably is an important way in which they minimize um, the contaminants. So basically it's constant attention, constant gardening um, that is allowing them to keep these colonies so clean. Uh, another question from Nitin. He's asking uh, if something wrong happens to the fungus, will the ants survive or will they change their behavior of taking and digesting the food? No, so if they lose their fungus garden, the ants, um, as far as we know, are not capable of acquiring a new fungal garden and they are dependent on the garden for their food. So the worker ants can sometimes get a little bit of nutrition from other sources. So for example, when the leaf cutters are cutting leaves, they actually can, can consume some of the, um, the, the plant matter, some of the, the juices of those plant leaves uh, as they're cutting them and they get a little bit of nutrients uh, that way. But for the larvae and the pupae inside the nest, they exclusively consume the uh, fungi. So for the colony to persist, there has to be a fungus garden there for those uh, developing ants to be able to eat. So if they lose the garden, they die. Uh, so another question, uh, we consider it as a type of symbiotic relationship, but here it's, uh, there is something additional that the symbiote, symbiote also serves as food. So should it be considered as a separate type of relationship than simple symbiosis? Yeah, that's a really good question, right? So you, you say, so from the point of view of the fungi, they're being consumed. And so is that really so good if you're the fungus? Um, I think the, the thing is though, that the ants of course never consume all of it. And so if you think about how much of this fungus would be able to grow and proliferate on its own versus how much grows and proliferates, um, you know, when they're being cultivated by ants. Um, certainly in the case of the leaf cutter ants, the, the fungi achieve an enormous biomass uh, within these nests. And uh, it's hard to imagine these fungi would be capable of doing anything like that on their own. So, um, I, but it's a good point. I mean, the, the ants are consuming uh, this, this fungal matter, um, but you know, it seems that in, in the balance of things that the fungi are still benefiting from having all of the material that they are going to be um, uh, growing on brought to them, housed underground, freed from having to worry about competitors thanks to the constant gardening, um, and, uh, and then dispersed out across the environment by queens that are going uh, to establish new nests. So I think all in all, the fungi do quite well by, by being part of the symbiosis. Uh, the non-native ants, uh which are invading a particular area, they displace the native ants, but they facilitate non-predatory invertebrates. How's it happening? They facilitate non-predatory 
invertebrates. So it sounds like maybe it's a question about some possible benefits that might come from uh, the the uh, spread of non-native ants. And that's something that we we haven't actually been looking at the, um, the interactions between non-native ants and other invertebrates so far in our work. It's actually something that we're interested in doing. Um, we have some samples that might allow us to do that. But so far, we've really been focusing on just ant communities and trying to understand native versus non-native ants, how they're interacting with one another. But um, it would be interesting to look at uh, how those interactions extend to other species. And, and certainly, there's been plenty of work that's been done in other areas looking at the, the role of, of non-native uh, ants and other, and other invertebrates. So hopefully, we'll be able to do that eventually. Uh -huh. What's the role of uh, metapleural gland secretions in controlling the fungal infections? Oh, that's a very good question. So metapleural gland is something um, that ants have that uh, produces secretions that uh, are thought to be antimicrobial and have other uh, benefits. And so um, this is something that is uh, until recently not very well understood. I think the metapleural gland um, is interesting in that it uh, uh, is different sizes in different ant species. Um, and the exact role that it plays is still uh, largely unknown. So in fungus growing ants, we, we really don't know that much about the role specifically of metapleural gland. Um, it probably does play something of a role, um, but it hasn't been very well studied in terms of, of what role it might be playing with the uh, fungus growing ant symbiosis. Uh, probably a last question, if I don't get any more. Uh, interspecific mutualisms have often produced synergistic co-adaptations that allowed them to use previously inaccessible resources. What are such symbiotic adaptations in fungal cultivars of leaf cutting ants? So let me see. I'm not sure if I understood the question. So the question is, what are some ways in which having this um, this symbiosis between different species, how is that allowing uh, allowing new functions to evolve? Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, right. So, I mean, I think the, the fact that if we're talking about the inter, in, interspecific interactions here between the ants and the fungi, um, I mean, it's, it's basically completely transformed the ecology of um, uh, of these ants and by extension of their ecosystems. Um, you know, I didn't talk about the impact of these leaf cutting ants on their ecosystems, but they're actually considered the dominant herbivores of the, the neotropics. Um, because these ants have been able to take advantage of a resource as abundant as live uh, plant matter, you know, uh, leaves, um, it has made them uh, a, a force to be reckoned with. I mean, the, the, an individual colony of leafcutter ants can, uh, can defoliate an entire tree overnight. So the impacts on, on, uh, on trees that, uh, and, and other uh, plants that have to um, evolve defenses against these uh, ants is, um, is, is considerable. Um, and the, uh, the nutrient cycling that comes from taking that plant matter from above ground, bringing it below ground, where it's being uh, uh, processed by the fungi and then consumed by the ants and then turned into refuse, uh, that in turn has actually a positive benefit on plants because it's contributing um, uh, to nutrient cycling actually deep underground and keeping, especially in the tropics where uh, most of the fertile, uh, most of the soil is very uh, unfertile, it's contributing to uh, soil fertility, which of course benefits plants. So there's all sorts of ways in which this particular symbiosis has dramatic impacts on the entire ecology of the ecosystem in which uh, they occur. So I'm not sure if that's exactly what the, the question was addressing, but I, I, it's really interesting to think about all of the other effects that come from just this one particular interaction. So now I'll request uh, Dr. Grindawalia to propose a formal vote of thanks. Good morning, everybody. On the behalf of Department of Zoology and Environmental Sciences, it is my privilege to express my gratitude to everyone. First of all, I extend my thanks to Professor Scott Solomon for giving very informative and thought-provoking lecture. He explained how fungus growing ants play a role in the agriculture. 
department had started the webinar series on 6 june 2020 so i also i owe my sincere thanks to previ previous speakers namely professor ls shashidara from ashoka university sonipat professor amitabh joshi from jncsr bengaluru professor trivor d price the university of chicago dr ramare bhat indian institute of science bengaluru dr jun e strassman washington university in st louis usa professor vidita vidya institute of fundamental research mumbai dr natasha mahatre western university london ontario canada dr ribaka uman university of osio norway dr ehab abu sahib magil university montreal quebec and they spared time their time for the lectures and shared information about their research activities which is very useful for the student as well as the research community i am also grateful to honorable vice chancellor chancellor for sparing time from his busy schedule and grace the occasion under his able guidance and perfect logistic support department has organized these series of webinars i also my thanks to computer department for providing all the necessary facilities for successful organization of these webinars lastly i am also thankful to the viewers for their keen interest and participation in the webinars thank you very much thank you grinda so the last item that is we'll stand up for the national anthem dr bharti to play the national anthem please or oh, can you uh, stop your screen sharing yes Thank you all. Thank you very much.